this day up here today, baby. Yeah, it's the fifth Sunday. Oh, <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're in week two of our series, and we're talking about the highly debated subject of judging. Now, if you were with us last week, we kind of hit the basics of, of this whole subject of, of judgment and uh, ended up having some great discussion in our live group. That's why we always want to keep inviting you to live group. There's some really good discussion goes on about this. And if last week was some basic stuff on judging, then this week is, is going to be like some advanced study. This is not this is not milk. This is meat. This is really deep stuff we're going to be talking about this week. And i got to warn you up front, some of the language, some of the situation is PG-13. And since we have some junior Christians in training upstairs today, this is the fifth Sunday of the month, we're going to replace some of the phrases and things in here. We're going to use the phrase, bailing hay, because that's what I could come up with. If you want to know what it means more than that, read your Bible. You've got it right here with you in the back of you. Just follow along in your Bible. And I also want to say this, and I say this often. It's okay to disagree. It is okay to have another opinion than what I am teaching. And, and as my old college professor used to tell me, just make sure that your opinion or that your conclusion is factual and biblically sound. In other words, make sure you can back it up with scripture. That's, and, and I just want to kind of leave that aside. Another thing is, if last week's teaching left you with a few things to chew on, this week's probably going to be more than a mouthful for you. And if you leave here today with more questions than answers, then you're probably on the right track. There's nothing wrong with you just hanging there the next couple of weeks. We're, we're not going to resolve anything today. Now, before we begin jumping into Scripture and, and teaching, I want to begin with an example today. Years ago, I got a call from a guy I knew, and, and he, he called me up. He said, you know, hey, uh, got an issue going on at church. He said, our pastor is getting divorced. Uh, he was married to this woman for 22 years, I think, something like that, had four kids. He said that the pastor says that uh, he, he never married the woman that God intended for him. But he had met the woman that God intended for him. Now, incidentally, she was 18 years younger than his married. And the kids were going to go live with mom and leave. And, and he said, you know, they, they talked about it in church, and the church voted, and they decided to extend some grace. They're going to let him keep pastor. And he says, should I leave and find another church? And I said, buddy, I'm going to tell you what. It's time to argue in the OFT as quick as you can. You run off from that <laughs> church and leave. Go somewhere else. Now, is that being judgmental? Yeah. Yeah, you bet it is. It is being judgmental. You know, another one, a guy joined this church that I was working at at the time. And this guy came to us and he wanted to be a part of the children's ministry. Well, you know, in this church, we, we did some background checks, and we found out that he was a convicted predator. And somebody actually asked us, they said, well, you think we should vote whether we should let him work there or not? No. No. He's a convicted child molester. You, know, you, don't, you don't do that. Is that judgmental? Yep. Yeah, sure it is. Here's another one. One time, my wife was working in a large church years and years ago when we met, and there was a couple that had served together, and they were in small group. These two couples, you know, they served together in, in children's ministry. They were in small group together. Well, the husband from one side of the couple and the wife from the other side of the couple, well, they they were bailing hay. <laughs> Jimmy, you and your Amish buddies are never going to look at that the same way. <laughs> Neither am I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can imagine, it ended up in a big, nasty divorce. And all of a sudden, when they came back, they couldn't serve. The church wouldn't let them serve because they were in an adulterous situation. Now, is that being judgmental? Yeah. Yeah. Let me give you a biblical example. Jesus confronted these religious leaders, and he says, Hey, you know what, guys? I know who you are. I see what you're doing. You're cheating. You're lying. You're hurting people. And you're doing it all in the name of God. You, and he uses these words. He said, You are a den of thieves. You know, you're a brood of vipers. And then he calls them this word, and we talked about this last week. He says, you're a bunch of hypocrites. Now, is that being judgmental? Yep, sure is. You know, and then and this seems so contradictory because other times Jesus, he didn't seem to judge at all. I mean, he just didn't seem to judge at all. You remember the, the tax collector that was so small he climbed up in a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus? 
Remember what his name was? Anybody remember that? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. You know the song, Zacchaeus was a little I would sing it for you. But you get the point. You know, Zacchaeus. And, he, and Jesus ends up going to his house for dinner. He just doesn't seem to be judgmental at all. You know what? Jesus was always hanging out with sinners, with prostitutes. He's talking to them, sharing a meal with them. He was never judgmental with that. It seems like there's this double standard going on. You know, or what about when he approached the tax collector named Matthew? You know, he could have thrown all kinds of judgment calls this man's way. You know, he was a tax collector for the Romans. I mean, this guy was a professional chief. He was a professional crook. And Jesus, he, he, didn't, he didn't throw any accusations or anything. He just simply come up and say, hey, Matthew, come follow me. And, and not only just come follow me, I want, to be, I want you to be part of my inner circle. You know, I want you to be one of the guys that's closest to me. Be one of us. And it just almost seems like there's this big double standard going on with Jesus when it comes to making judgment calls. And I don't know about you, and perhaps you're like me, but a part of Scripture, that, that part of Scripture in particular, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable. It makes me just a little bit uncomfortable. Why? And I'll tell you, because somewhere along the way, we have bought into this whole idea, and this probably comes from just taking bits and pieces of Scripture and not studying the, the whole Scripture, which, you know, that's that's one reason why when, when we teach up here, I use a whole piece of Scripture, because we don't want bits and pieces, but that's probably where it comes from. But we bought into the whole idea that we should never judge, period. Never, period. You know, end of discussion, we should never judge anything. And if you were here last week, we talked about how frustrating and how humiliating it can be if you're on the end of receiving judgment. It can destroy relationships. And because of that, we said we have to be very, very careful. We have to make sure that we position ourselves and that we examine ourselves, that we look at our motives and we ask ourselves, why does this situation even matter to me? Long before we ever begin to judge. And for most of us, we're kind of left in confusion about judging, aren't we? I mean, for us, it just seems like the Christian thing to do is just to not judge, period. Now, here's the thing. When you look at the New Testament, and when you look at the life of Jesus and the men and women that choose to follow him, that's not what you see. It's not what you see at all. In fact, what you find in Scripture, you find two different groups of people. One that shouldn't be judged, and one that should be judged. And what is unfortunate is that we, the followers of Jesus or the church, we goof this up and we flip-flop these groups all the time. You know, if you're a Christian, you think about this. We extend grace almost without question. It seems like you can just about get away with anything. If you're a Christian out there, we're willing to extend grace your way just without any question because other Christians, Christians were always quick to forgive. You know, it's kind of like we're saying to ourselves, well, let's just not judge our brothers or sisters. But if you're a non-believer, then look out. Because we pass judgment at the drop of the hat. You know, and you've heard people say this before. Oh, I don't hang around those kind of people. You know, I don't even talk to them. They're no good and never will be. We're quick to pass judgments on non-believers. And at the same time, we're more than willing to let a fellow Christian slot at any time. And I'm going to tell you and we'll get to this preaching or teaching here in a moment. But this is not what Scripture teaches. In fact, Scripture teaches the exact opposite. But for whatever reason, we often get this wrong. And I believe because of that, that this is one of the big reasons that so many people outside of the church and outside of Christianity, they're not in a real big hurry to get in the inside. Because they see us as a group of people that will look down on them. They will pass judgment on non-believers, but at the same time, we just extend grace to believers, and we never want to judge them. Now, in scriptures, we're going to see, tells us that we get it backwards. We get that backwards all the time. And scripture is going to teach us that sometimes judging, judging is loving. That there are situations that require us to judge because that is the loving thing to do. And to refuse to judge is to refuse to love. Now, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be going to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to tell you, this is a very, very deep, deep piece of Scripture. 
1 Corinthians is the first of two letters that we have that Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. Now, Paul wrote several letter, letters to the church of Corinth. We, we know this because it, it divulges us out in Scripture. And the Apostle Paul, incidentally, he started this church at Corinth. He was the one that planted this church as well as many others. So Apostle Paul, he had wrote this letter to them. And, and we don't know a lot about this church here at Corinth. But we do know that they would have been entirely Greek. This would not have been a Jewish community. So the whole idea to them of having one God and that God becoming flesh in Jesus and, and dying on the cross, <coughs> and, you know, all those things that we take for granted that we know, that would have been very, very difficult for them because they would have grown up with the Greek gods. You know, they'd have been grown up in a, in a Greek culture. And if you've ever studied any of that in school, you know you know what I'm talking about. Zeus and Apollo and Poseidon, Athena, you know, all these Greek gods. And each one of these Greek gods, you know, they, they stood for something. So the whole idea to them of, of a Savior or of Jesus would have been completely foreign. It would have been very, very difficult for them to think about one God. And then when you throw in that one God that is three in one, that whole trinity... You know, of, of God being, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that would have really been tough. So my guess is that this church, it was probably pretty small. It's probably a pretty tight-knit church, and maybe even several of the people were related there at the church. Well, anyway, Paul, he gets word. And, and if you ever hear someone say that, well, I want to be a church of the New Testament. Well, I'm going to tell you what, after reading this, you really won't. You really won't. You're going to want to be a lot better than that. But Paul, he gets word that there's this guy in this church who's a part of this fellowship. He's a follower of Jesus, and he's essentially bailing hay with his stepmother, which is just gross. It's just gross. And it's completely unacceptable. And it's even so unacceptable. It's unacceptable to the pagan Greek culture, which coincidentally they accepted homosexuality and adultery. That was okay. But this wasn't. This wasn't. This was way beyond this. It was Completely unacceptable. So the Apostle Paul, he writes to them and he's addressing this issue. And look what he says. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes. He said, It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, and of a kind that even the pagans do not tolerate. A man is, and once again, read your Bibles, he's bailing hay with his father's wife. Now he's saying, in other words, Mark. You have some things going on here that they don't even have ratings for. You went way above this. You know, you just went to a new level of, oh my, oh my. You know, this is crazy. And this is really, really, really important. You know, this this is not, you know, oh man, I made a bad decision or I sinned and I really regret all this going on. This is a situation that a man has embraced a lifestyle of sin. You know, in other words, I know it's wrong. You know what's wrong, but this is what I want. This is what we want. And you know, I don't really care if it's morally right. Verse 2, he says, and you're proud of it. Shouldn't you have rather gone into mourning and have put out your fellowship to the man who has been doing this? In other words, Paul says, you're proud of it. You just don't think it's okay. You're celebrating this. You're celebrating this lifestyle. He says, shouldn't you go into mourning? And, and this is important. This is very important. Because Paul is essentially saying, shouldn't this break your heart? I mean, shouldn't you be able to see this situation and think, you know, there's nothing good can come of this? Shouldn't this have broken your heart? And Paul says, shouldn't you put him out? Shouldn't you put him out? And here's the tension that so many of us struggle with because Paul presents to us two conflicting ideas that we just don't seem like we can resolve very easily. Paul says... When you found this out, two things should have happened. First, it should have broken your heart. It should have broken your heart. And second, you should have asked him to leave. And the conflict for us is that if it breaks our heart, then shouldn't we draw him in? I mean, isn't that the Christian thing to do? Shouldn't we draw him in? And the Apostle Paul says no. Well, isn't that being judgmental, Paul? Yeah. Sure is. Verse 3, he continues. He said, for my part, even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. As the one who is present with you in this way, I've already passed judgment.
judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing all of this. And when we read that, we think, wait a minute, Paul. We're Christians. We don't judge people. We don't want to do that. Paul's saying, hey, look, I'm one of the first Christians, and I passed judgment. And I not only passed it, I documented it. Wrote it down right here where you can read it. Verse 4, he says this. So when you are assembled, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of the Lord Jesus is present, and this is tough. He said, hand this man over to Satan.
Paul understood that sometimes judging is loving. Verse 6, now Paul's addressing the church in this, verse 6. He says, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast and yeast in the New Testament is always correlated with sin? So don't you know that a little sin, it leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast. In other words, get rid of that sin so that you may be an unleavened batch. In other words, that you might be sin-free as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. You know, Paul's saying, it's not only bad for him, it's bad for you. This is bad for you. Because a little sin, a little bit of corruption, throw in some compromise with that, and pretty soon you got Satan's casserole. And it's sitting in front of you. Sin will work its way into everything. And Paul was simply saying, if you love him, if you love your church, then you got to make a judgment call. And Paul finishes up by saying something that should be in every one of our hearts, and it's something we should never, ever, ever take lightly. And that is that we believe that Christ died for our sin. If you're a Christian today, you believe that Christ died for your sin. Our sin is what sent Jesus to the cross. The penalty for sin is death. And as Christians, we believe that Jesus gave his life so that we might only experience death in our mortal bodies, not in our soul. Jesus has paid your sin debt, and it cost him his life. And Paul is suggesting here, why would you embrace a Christian that has chosen to embrace a sin so willingly and so easily when Jesus has paid such a high price for that sin? Now, let that sink in for a moment. Let that kind of resonate with you for a moment. If Jesus was so willing to die for you and your sin, then why is it so hard for us to do what is necessary to live for him? Why is that so tough? Now, look, we gather here every Sunday to celebrate. We gather here every Sunday to worship God for sending Jesus to die for our sins so that we might be forgiven and that we might be redeemed and that we might be holy and pleasing in the eyes of God. So why in the world would we embrace any sin? Why would, why would we do that? When that sin is the very thing that killed Christ. Why, why would we embrace that? Sometimes the requirement of love is judgment. Paul says, I want this guy out. I want him out so that we can get him back. That's why I want him out, so that we can get him back. We cannot embrace the very thing that killed our sin. And here's what I know. When you get comfortable with sin, you'll get comfortable with compromise. And pretty soon, that high price that was paid for your sin, it's easily discounted. We forget about it. Sometimes the cost of loving someone is judgment. It's judgment. Now, in the midst of all this going on, it's almost like the Apostle Paul, he has this aha moment. He begins to think, wait a minute. Maybe my first letter was confusing them, and we know that he wrote a letter before 1 Corinthians. We don't know what it was. We don't have that. But in verse 9, the Apostle Paul, he takes this turn to add some clarity to all this. So verse 9, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, I wrote to you in my letter, and once again, we don't have that letter, so we don't know. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world, who are immoral, or the greedy, or the swindlers, or the idolaters. And then Paul kind of tries to throw his funny part in there. He says, in that case, you'd have to leave this world. You know, he says, he says, you remember that first letter that I wrote, and I said to stay away from those type of people? Well, maybe you misunderstood, or I didn't convey it correctly. I was talking about believers, not the unbelievers of the world, not the people outside of the faith, to which these people probably went, oh, I thought we were supposed to judge everybody the same. Paul said, no, 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 no. And look at this, verse 11. Paul says, but now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, in other words, inside the faith, be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer or a drunkard or a swindler. Boy, that list just goes on and on and on. Do not even eat with such people. Now, isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting how we mess this up? Because we develop a standard that when those outside of the faith, when they don't match up, 
We'll drop the gavel and say him then pretty quick. It happens pretty quick. And Paul is telling us, don't you dare do it. They don't live by your standards. But when you have someone that believes that Christ died for their sin, and they begin to embrace sin as if it meant nothing, then you just use your head. Just use your head. This is why it was so easy for Jesus to condemn the Pharisees. Because he constantly put them in, the, in their place. And he refused to associate them. It's also why it was so easy for him to approach men like Zacchaeus and, and Matthew. You know, you had one group, these Pharisees, who was on the inside. And you had one group who's on the outside. And guess which one Jesus came for? Guess which one he came for? In fact, Jesus would simply say, I'd rather that the ones on the inside, the ones that have embraced a sinful lifestyle... I'd really rather they be on the outside. You know, let them get a good dose of sin. You know, let them get a good dose of the same thing that God went through the cross for. And I want you to look at how Paul closes this up in verse 13. And I ask if you would, let's, let's read this. You know, Paul says, read this together. Who? God. God will judge those outside. He says God's going to judge them outside. You know, so when you judge people outside of the church, whose job are you taking? God's. God's. You know what I think the biggest problem in the modern church today is? We don't trust God to do his part. We don't have faith that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. Paul tells us, you expel the wicked person from among you. So my question is, what do we do with that? Now, a couple things, and then I'll, I'll close. First off, this is not a witch hunt. It's not a witch hunt. We're to keep each other accountable when circumstances are extreme, and we're called to make judgment calls. If someone embraces a lifestyle of sin, yet claims to love a Savior that died for that sin, then love requires you to judge. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's tough teaching. That's very deep, and it's way beyond Jesus loves me this, I know, just because the Bible told me so. And I'll say this. When you take this principle and you use it to justify lowering the boom on someone, then the thing is, you got a plank in your eye, you better get it out before you go looking for sawdust in your brother's eye. Because this principle, it's about restoration. It's not about justice. It's all about restoration. And your brother's sin, it should break your heart. And when it does that, then you know you're ready to have a talk. You know you're ready to have a conversation. Second thing is, you and I, we ain't God. And we haven't got the authority to judge those outside of our faith. How in the world could we hold someone accountable to a standard that they never agreed upon in the first place? Let me ask you can you imagine the way the world would look at the church if we got that little bit right? Could you imagine how the people on the outside would look at the people on the inside if we got just that little bit right. Folks, I want to tell you, we're not here to judge the world. We're here to love it unconditionally. We're here to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're here to be the bride of Christ. We're here to be a beacon of light in a dark and cruel place. We are here to celebrate and to love a Savior that died to set us free from the bondage of sin. And if we can do that, I want to tell you something. People on the outside, they're going to want to be in. They're going to want to be in. Because when sin has had its way with you, when sin has beaten you up so bad that you can't take it anymore, well, that's when Jesus says, you come to me. You come to me because you don't have to take it any longer. Because I'll do it for you. Can you imagine if we got that right? I want to ask our musicians to come forward this morning to close us. And I'm going to invite you this morning. And I give this invitation every Sunday, but I truly mean it. If you've never asked Jesus into your heart, then this morning is a great time to do it. This morning is a great time.